So yeah, Intel just launched their new Core Ultra CPUs for desktop PCs, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the all-new Intel Core Ultra 9 285K. What's going on everybody, it's ETA Prime back here again. I've personally been really excited about the launch of these new Core Ultra chips for desktops, seeing what their mobile Core Ultra chips can do, at least their Series 2 chips. I've been a big fan of those, so hopefully some of that does transfer over to the desktop variants. And like I mentioned, we're going to be taking a look at the Intel Core Ultra 9 285K. With this, we get 24 cores, 24 threads. They've kind of cut out that multi-threading when it comes to these new chips, just like they did with their mobile series two. And when it comes to core configuration, we've still got the performance and efficiency cores, eight performance, 16 efficiency, and those performance cores can boost up to 5.7 gigahertz. In this video, we're going to be building a PC around that Ultra 9 285K, and throughout the build, I will go over the parts used here, starting with the new Z890 motherboard. This is the ASRock Nova, and they've done some really interesting stuff. They've got a new quick release for their PCIe slot, massive VRM cooler, and with this new chipset, it will support up to 8200MHz RAM. This is the Wi-Fi version of the board, and it comes pre-installed with Wi-Fi 7. And by the way, this board also supports up to six M.2 SSDs, all PCIe 4.0. I've been a big fan of ASRock motherboards for a while now, and I do think that their new Nova line looks really good. They also make it for the AM5 platform. But obviously, we're putting together an Intel build today, and when it comes to memory, I'm going with a 32 gig kit from G-Skill. This is their Trident Z5 Royal, running at 6,000 megahertz. And we could go faster with it if we want to. I'm not going to overclock it. We're just going to set up that XMP profile, get it up to 6,000, and see what this can do. Obviously, for this build, we're going to need a case for everything to go inside of. And I've actually had this sitting for a little while now. This is the Lian Lee 011 Vision. Triple glass side panels. It's more of kind of a showcase case, but I do like the look of it. And they do make a couple different variants. I've got the black steel version, but they also make this in white and you can pick it up in aluminum, but it's going to be a bit more expensive in aluminum. Around back here, awesome cable management. We can mount a ton of drives if you want to use 2.5 or 3.5 inch drives. And one of my favorite things here is we've got the motherboard tray. So this whole section will come out so we can build this on the bench. We can throw our GPU in here at the same time and just kind of set it right back down in there. Now, usually I go small form factor with most of my builds, but given that we've got a full size ATX motherboard, I definitely had to go a bit bigger. And when it comes to the GPU, I could have went with an RTX 4090 if I wanted to, but I'm actually going to be going with the RTX 4070 Ti Super from Zotac. One of the reasons is I usually game at 1440p and this is more than enough. It's not going to pull a ton of power. I mean, obviously comparing it to a lower end card, it will. But for what we've got here, I think this is going to be more than enough for 1440. And yeah, I do love this motherboard tray system. Just go ahead and put it right back in there. And now I need to worry about cooling that Ultra 9 285K. I'm not exactly sure what to expect here, but given the size of the case, we do have enough room for a 360 millimeter AIO. So I opted to use the Thermaltake TH360V2. And to send power to the CPU and GPU, I'm going with an 850 watt ASUS Prime fully modular power supply. And once it's all together, it looks a little something like this. I did have a few Thermaltake fans that I could add to the bottom here, and obviously I went with that black and white aesthetic. Usually I either go all black or all white. I figured I'd go ahead and mix it up, given that we had that black case there, and I had a bunch of white parts ready to go. Now it's time for the moment of truth. All right. So I'm going to be running Windows 11 Pro here, but the first thing I want to do is hop into the BIOS and just take a look at what we've got going on. So real quick, before we get into Windows, from the BIOS here, if we head over to Advanced Mode, with this ASRock board under our Overclock Tweaker, Power Delivery Profile, I'm going to be set to the Intel Default Mode. But keep in mind, we've got a couple to choose from, like the ASRock Extreme Mode, Intel Baseline Mode. And with this, basically, it's going to take that wattage up, clocks up, We've also got a gaming overclock preset. There's two right now with this motherboard, stage one, stage two. This is gonna optimize the CPU frequencies. But again, for this, we're gonna be right here with the Intel default mode. I wanna leave it just like this. Getting right into Windows here. I've been up and running for a little while now. In fact, for the past few days, I've been testing out this CPU. And as you can see, we've got the Intel Core Ultra 9 285K. 
I thought having, you know, no extra threads here would kind of hurt us. 24 cores, 24 threads, but it seems like we're seeing some really good performance. And of course, we do have that NPU here. I mean, if you're going to be using it with this desktop CPU, you definitely could if you want to. But uh, real quick, I wanted to give you an idea of our TDP and clock. So I've got CPU Z right here. We're going to stress this out. And with that Intel baseline, you can see this does jump up to around 240 watts. And this is just stock out of the box in this ASRock motherboard. Up here, looking around 4.8 gigahertz, but while gaming, it's definitely going to boost on up for us. But so far, I've been seeing some really good performance out of this chip. And the very first thing I want to take a look at are some benchmarks. The first one we have here is Geekbench 6. And with the new 285K, we got a single core of 3,297, multi 21,707. And just to give you an idea, my 14900K in a very similar setup like this, got a single core of 3,082, multi 20,717. Next on the list, we've got Cinebench R23. Total multi-core here for that Ultra 9 285K, 43,021. And of course, I mean, it's beaten everything here on the list. R23 is a bit older, so I did run R24, single and multi. And with this, single core coming in with a pretty impressive 149, beating out the i7-14700K and the Apple M1 Max. And when it comes to multi, 2,478. And this is looking really good given that we don't have those extra threads like we used to with the 13900K and the 14900K. I also ran PC Mark 10, and with this setup here, we got a total score of 9,974. And the last thing I ran was Time Spy. Now, of course, this score is going to be up or down depending on your GPU, but if we take a look at that CPU score, we're right there at 20,577. And with this Core Ultra 9 285K paired up with this RTX 4070 Ti Super, I'm seeing some great 1440p gaming performance. So let's go ahead and jump over there now. First game we have is Black Myth Wukong. I'm just using the built-in benchmark here. We're at high settings with no DLSS, no frame generation. We can get over 100 FPS with this if you want to use some frame generation, scale it down a bit, but we're at a true 1440p resolution. And with this setup, we managed to hit 68 FPS on average at 1440p high settings. Next up, we've got Starfield at 1440p Ultra with some DLSS. We're actually set to quality right now. This does take a toll on your CPU, as you can see from Afterburner up in the top left-hand corner. In some cases, we're hitting around 170 watts just on the CPU side of things, but we are in a cityscape right now, and these are kind of hard to run with Starfield. If you've ever tried this out, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But it doesn't look like uh, we're having any issues here with this Ultra 9 285K. Red Dead 2, 1440p, ultra settings, no DLSS. Indoors, we're seeing averages of around 150. Outdoors, around 142 FPS on average. CPU is pulling around 115 watts. I mean, not too bad. I actually thought it would be a bit more here at 1440. And so far, with this thermal take, 360 millimeter AIO, even at those higher wattages, we're not hitting thermal throttle while gaming. And by the end of the video, we'll definitely take a look at our average and maximum CPU temps here. Plus, we're going to get an idea of how much wattage this pulls on average. Why should I? I definitely had to test out Cyberpunk 2077, so here we are at 1440p Ultra Settings. DLSS is set to quality in order to get on up there. We're seeing averages of around 85 FPS with this, and again, taking a look at that CPU package power up there, up to around 155 watts in some cases. And the final one we have here is God of War Ragnarok 1440p Ultra. DLSS is set to quality, no frame gen. And I've been testing this quite a bit on uh, lower end PCs. I noticed that it really does stress out that CPU. But while I was playing this, I was eyeballing that CPU package power up there. And you know, I figured we'd be on up there 130 up to 160. On average, we're pulling 111 watts from this new 285K running God of War Ragnarok with these settings. You. It's 
The final thing I wanted to talk about here were CPU temps and power consumption. So I'm using that Thermaltake TH360V2, the 360 millimeter AIO. Average CPU temps with this 285K were only 62 degrees Celsius, and the maximum that I saw while running Cinebench R24, that multi-core test, 93. That's definitely an extreme use case scenario. Well, gaming, we're not gonna see these kind of temps using a cooler like this, but it really came down to that maximum CPU power consumption. Now on average, we only pulled around 109 watts, but the maximum I saw was 301 watts. And again, that's more of an extreme case while running benchmarks, maxing out all 24 cores there can really draw some wattage. So yeah, that 285K can go past that 300 watt mark. But in the end, I mean, I'm seeing really good performance out of this CPU. I've still got a lot of testing that I want to do with the Ultra 9 285K. So if there's anything else you want to see running with something like this, let me know in the comments below. I want to see how this thing handles overclocking. Uh, we're definitely going to take the wattage up on it, see what kind of scores we can get with a different power profile. I'd also like to test the Linux operating system with this chip, so I will have more videos on the way. If you're interested in seeing something like that, make sure you hit the like button and think about subscribing. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. If you're interested in learning about any of the parts used in this build, I'll leave links in the description. Like always, thanks for watching.